This audio lecture is based entirely upon the case books Liberty, Equality, and Due Process, Cases, Controversies, and Contexts in Constitutional Law, and First Amendment, Cases, Controversies, and Contexts by Ruth Ann Robson. The case books are published by Cali E. Langdell Press and licensed Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0. That means that the author has allowed everyone to copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format and remix, transform, and build upon the material as long as users give appropriate credit. Don't use the material for commercial purposes and redistribute contributions under the same license. Much thanks is due to Ruthann for writing these books and providing them to everyone for free. In furtherance of this spirit and in compliance with the original license, I also license this audio lecture as Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0. I hope you enjoy. Welcome, everybody, to Section 3 of the United States Constitution Lectures. In this section, we'll discuss slavery and racial equality. Constitutional equality before the Reconstruction Amendments. Recall that although the notion of equality is in the Declaration of Independence, It is not in the Articles of Confederation or the Constitution before the Reconstruction Amendments. Despite the Constitution's preamble, we the people, generally speaking, people who counted as people in the Constitution were white and male. As for women, the Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation, and pre Reconstruction Constitution do not address sex or gender, implicitly assuming a male political body despite a population of roughly 50% women. As for Native Americans, the Constitution recognizes the sovereignty of Indian tribes, explicitly in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 which gives Congress, rather than states, the power to regulate commerce with Indian tribes. And implicitly in Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, which declares the Constitution supreme, also provides that treaties entered into by the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. In 1789, there were at least nine treaties with Indian nations. Most contentious in the Constitution was the status of enslaved persons. The 1789 Constitution enshrined slavery, albeit without ever using the term. Despite the absence of the word, the so-called compromise among the framers of the Constitution regarding slavery, appears in a number of provisions. One of the most well-known compromises also implicates women and Native Americans, as well as federal-state relations, federalism, and democracy, another term that does not appear in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 regarding representation in the House of Representatives of Congress, provides, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states, which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. This provision itself was 
a compromise regarding how representation among the states in the House of Representatives should be apportioned. The competing proposition was that representation should be linked to commerce or taxes paid to the federal government. This would essentially be representation of states based on their wealth. Once it was decided it should be people rather than money, however, the question was which people should be counted. The initial proposal was that population should be the whole number of white and other free citizens and inhabitants of every age, sex, and condition, including those bound to servitude for a term of years and three-fifths of all other persons not comprehended in the foregoing description, except Indians paying taxes in each state. Supposedly for stylistic reasons, every age, sex, and condition was omitted. As applied, women and children were counted as part of the population. The provision explicitly excluded Indians not taxed from being counted in the population to be represented in the House of Representatives of Congress. This assumes that Indians who did not reside on sovereign tribal lands would pay taxes and be part of the population. The inclusion of all persons who were free, even if not white, or indentured for a term of years in the population calculation, recognized both free people of color and all indentured servants. Note that indentured servants were usually Europeans who had attained passage to the United States. Sometimes this passage was as punishment for a crime or as a release from debtor's prison. Sometimes persons bought passage for economic advancement or personal reasons. Sometimes persons were assigned passage by their families. Indentured servants were to work without pay for a set period, often seven years, although the term could be extended for infractions including minor crimes, inadequate service, or pregnancy. During the time of servitude, one could not quit, but one was considered a servant and not property or chattel. And after the term ended, one was a free person. The three-fifths of all other persons portion of Article 1 is the most infamous. All other persons meant enslaved persons. In general, the northern states in which slavery was minimal wanted slaves to not count as persons. The southern states in which enslaved persons were a majority of the population wanted slaves to be counted as full persons. This may seem paradoxical, But what was at stake was how large the number of representatives in Congress would be. The compromise was that each enslaved person would be counted as three-fifths of a person when calculating the total population as a basis for representation. Governor Morris, who despite his first name was never governor, but was later a United States senator from New York, famously criticized such a compromise during the Constitutional Convention. Quote, Upon what principle is it that the slaves shall be computed in the representation? Are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. Are they property? Why then is no other property? Included. However, the presumptive author of Federalist Paper No. 54, James Madison, argued that the Constitution was correct to view our slaves 
as possessing the mixed character of persons and of property. Madison contended that this was, in fact, their true character, although it was not necessarily a natural one. In addition to Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, several other provisions in the 1789 Constitution recognized slavery, again, without using the term. First, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1, and Article 5 guaranteed the importation of slaves into the United States until 1808. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 provided that the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Article 5, regarding amendments to the Constitution, exempted Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 from the amendment process until then. Note that Congress did pass the Act Prohibiting Importation of Slaves of 1807, signed by President Thomas Jefferson, which became effective January 1, 1808. Second, Article 4 mandated the recognition of slave status by all states. Article 4 is best known for requiring states to give full faith and credit to the proceedings of other states and to grant all privileges and immunities to citizens of other states. But it also contained the so-called Fugitive Slave Clause, It provided that no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall, in consequence by any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Lastly, and perhaps most obliquely, the Article 1, Section 8 powers of Congress include calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, implying the possibility of slave or other rebellions. Early cases applying the Reconstruction Amendments. In Ex Parte, Virginia, in 1880, the court had before it the indictment and arrest of a judge who did then and there exclude and fail to select as grand and petite jurors certain citizens of said county of Pennsylvania, of African race and black color. Said citizens possessing all other qualifications prescribed by law, and being by him excluded from the jury lists made out by him as such judge on account of their race, color, and previous condition of servitude, and for no other reason, against the peace and dignity of the United States and against the form of the statute of the United States in such case made and provided. At issue in Ex Parte, Virginia, was whether the statute was within congressional power under the 14th Amendment. The court, in an opinion, again by Justice William Strong, held it was, concluding that the judge could be punished. Quote, We do not perceive how holding an office under a state and claiming to act for the state can relieve the holder from obligation to obey the Constitution of the United States or take away the power of Congress to punish his disobedience. 
we do not perceive how holding an office under a state and claiming to act for the state can relieve the holder from obligation to obey the Constitution of the United States or take away the power of Congress to punish his disobedience. In Virginia versus Reeves of 1880, the question again involved the Congressional Civil Rights Statute, but this time focusing on a provision allowing for removal of a trial from state court to federal court when any person who is denied or cannot enforce in the judicial tribunals any right secured to him by any law providing for the equal civil rights of citizens of the United States. Yet the court, in an opinion again by Justice William Strong, found that the allegations of the defendants in the murder trial did not warrant removal. Quote, The assertions in the petition for removal that the grand jury by which the petitioners were indicted, as well as the jury summoned to try them, were composed wholly of the white race and that their race had never been allowed to serve as jurors in the county of Patrick in Virginia. In any case in which a colored man was interested, falls short of showing that any civil right was denied, or that there had been any discrimination against the defendants because of their color or race. The facts may have been as stated, and yet the jury which indicted them and the panel summoned to try them may have been impartially selected. End quote. Thanks, everybody. That's all I'd like to talk about in this section. Take care.